Okay, hello and welcome, Plato members and guests. I'm Marjane Frain. I'm the current president of the Plato Society of Los Angeles. If you are not a current member, but you love learning and discussing and people, then think about joining us. Um, we offer a totally unique learning environment and absolutely wonderful people. So let me... <laughs> Let me introduce Jan Moulton. She is the current chair of the Colloquium. Come in. Hi, everyone. It's great to see all of you here today. We have an exciting program planned. Before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to mention next month's Colloquium on Friday, March 27th. Note this is a Friday instead of our usual Thursday. On Friday, March 27th, we have the Archbishop of Los Angeles, Jose Gomez. He's a terrific speaker, and we hope you'll be able to join us. Just a note on logistics. Uh, today we're pleased that Plato's own Bill Clarkson is video recording this for YouTube. Yeah, big hand for Bill. <laughs> because he records it and edits it and, and posts it. And um, we're making this, or he is making it, a uh, colloquium tradition. And Bill tells me that uh, we had, for the last colloquium, which was District Attorney Jackie Lacey, we had over 74 views. So we do have people looking at it. So thank you. <laughs> um. <laughs> And uh, keep looking. <laughs> Turning to today's speaker, we have A. Scott Berg. He's the prize-winning biographer. He'll discuss his most recent book, Wilson, published in 2013. He's a prolific and very well-known writer, and we are thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to have him here today. Many thanks also to Joan Barton, for helping to arrange this. Ah, you're, you're an enthusiastic crowd today. That's terrific. <laughs> Mr. Berg attended Princeton University, and after graduating, he expanded his senior thesis on editor Maxwell Perkins into a full-length biography titled Max Perkins, Editor of Genius. It was published in 1978 and won a National Book Award I'm going to go through each of his books. His second book was about film mogul Samuel Goldman and was titled Goldman, a Biography, for which he received a Guggenheim Fellowship. Many of you are familiar with his third book about the famous aviator Charles Lindbergh that was published in 1998 and won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography. Kate Remembered is his fourth book. It's a biographical memoir of Catherine Hepburn, published in 2003. Today, Mr. Berg is going to speak on Woodrow Wilson across three centuries. When he gave me that title, I must confess, I had to think a little bit about it. Three centuries? <laughs> 19th, 20th, 21st? And I realized He's right, and also that I wanted to know a lot more about our 28th president. Just out of curiosity, I know that we have a lot of avid readers in the audience, so I'd just like to do a little poll here. Would you please raise your hand if you are currently reading one of Scott Berg's books or you have run, read one of his books in the past? Wow. <laughs> okay, that's an enthusiastic response. <laughs> Please do join me in welcoming Scott Berg. Oh, thanks. Well, thank you. I'll be coming back to this group. That was, that, that was really great. I was happy, happy and surprised to see that. Um, and I, I thank you for the uh, roundup of the books, too, because b before I talk about Wilson, which is going to be uh, the bulk of what I'm going to talk about, and I'm also getting a lot of reverb. Is this mic still hot? Now, it's off. It's off. Okay. So you all can hear me fine? It, it, it's, okay. Um, 
I, I thought before I talk about Wilson, uh, which I will for the, for the bulk of my time here today, uh, I did want to talk a little about the other books. This, boy, this is still reverbing. Oh. Not, not by reverb. For me, that's feedback. Oh, all right, feedback. I'm hearing a lot of... Because we're not hearing that out here. Oh, okay. All right, well, I will rise above listening to myself. <laughs> Which is a real, that's really a terrible thing. Um, but, he, but here we go. Um, because, you know, this is a, a kind of funny group for me in that uh, we have a couple of levels here. I know we're going to do a class afterwards, or, you know, the study group, those who are actually reading and studying Wilson. Um, and I do um, uh, want to give you all a general sense of Woodrow Wilson for those of you who aren't intensely studying Wilson. But also I wanted to leave time for plenty of questions if any of you has any questions about any of my other subjects. You gathered from hearing about the five books I've now done, um, they cover a pretty wide spectrum. But there are some great links that connect them all. Um, I decided uh, when I was um, actually just leaving college, and I had chosen to turn my senior thesis on Max Perkins into a book, um, you know, which was kind of a bold thing for a 21-year-old to decide. Um, you know, gee, I think I'll take this thesis, which everybody said was good, um, and maybe turn it into a book. Uh, but you know, it's a powerful impulse not to want to go to law school, and <laughs> and so. Um, having um, very supportive parents who said, well, you know, if you did go to law school, which we would love, um, you know, we would, we would pay for that. And if you were honored to be a doctor, we'd pay for you to go to med school, but you, you want to write this Max Perkins book, well, we will let you move back home, if you like. <laughs> Um, which was extremely generous on one hand. You know, they basically said you can have a room and three square meals a day. Uh, on the other hand, um, there I was in my mid, even late 20s, still living at home, um, which was, you know, it's kind of a, a difficult experience in some ways. I, I should add that the day my first book was published, when I came in for breakfast, there on the table were the real estate ads, um, <laughs> which, which my mother had courteously circled um, uh, several places, like, get out, get out. Okay. So, my first book was uh, on Max Perkins, who, if you don't know, was the greatest book editor in American literature. This man single-handedly changed the course of the mighty river that we call American literature. This is a man who got published. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Thomas Wolfe, Ring Lardner, Sherwood Anderson, he worked with Faulkner, Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, the yearling, remember Nancy Hale, Marcia Davenport, Taylor Caldwell, Erskine Caldwell, I could name another 50 of the great American writers of the 20th century. One man is responsible for getting them all published and guiding their careers. While I was turning my thesis into the book, I began to think, wouldn't it be interesting? Wouldn't it be challenging? to write not just a biography, but what about a shelf full of biographies of 20th century, I really didn't want to go to law school, uh, <laughs> 20th century American cultural figures. Each one, I began to think, would be from a different part of the country, and each one would be from a different wedge of the great apple pie that is American culture in the 20th century. So after doing Max Perkins, who was a ninth generation white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Harvard educated gentleman from New York and Vermont and Connecticut, a New Englander, uh, I turned my sights to the West Coast and I thought it would be interesting to write about one of those first generation barely literate in this case, East European Jews who migrated to the West Coast. And in this case, I selected somebody named Shmuel Gelbfish. Uh, uh, Shmuel Gelbfish uh, went upstate New York where he became a glove maker for a while, changed his name to Samuel Goldfish. Uh, and then within a few years, 
uh, fell in love with motion pictures. He saw a silent film one hot August afternoon in 1913 in Times Square, decided he was going nowhere in the glove business. Here was a brand new opportunity. And this is largely actually what the Goldwyn book is about. And the closest parallel I can think of today is Silicon Valley. I mean, Hollywood didn't exist yet. And in 1913, Samuel Goldfish still talked his brother-in-law, Jesse Lasky, into going into the movie business. And they got on a train and they came out to the end of the line where they rented a barn and there's allegedly a telegram that Goldfish back in New York received from Jesse Lasky saying, Sam, have rented a barn in a place called Hollywood. And this, they made a movie, a Western, a love story slash Western. This was Goldfish's idea. You know, make it a love story for the women and a Western for the men. They made a movie called The Squaw Man, which became the first feature film ever made in a place called Hollywood. It became a huge hit, and suddenly not only did this studio began to blossom, but other studios began to gravitate to that little, that area of Los Angeles, which was pepper trees and orange groves. And there, Hollywood was born. So that became my second book. My third book, I turned to the Midwest. Uh, and you know, I thought, who's the opposite of a Sam Goldwyn? And I thought of those great Midwestern you know, types, those figures. And I began to think, what are the great metaphors for 20th century Americana, the way the motion picture camera is. And obviously, the airplane is a great icon and a great American icon. And I began to think, well, who's a great totem of that? And of course, all roads led to Charles Lindbergh, which meant all roads led to the spirit of St. Louis. You know, and there I was, uh, spending a lot of time in the Midwest, writing the story of a man I believe is the first modern superstar. And so that book, which is largely about Lindbergh's life, is really also about the birth of modern high-tech celebrity, such as we have today. Um, and well, I'll give you my punchline for just when I talk about Lindbergh. But this much I believe to be true, that that, that car chase through the streets of Paris some years ago that resulted in the death of a princess actually began the night Charles Lindbergh landed in Paris. And they chased him, they ripped at his clothes, they tore his plane apart, and they chased him through the streets of Paris. And from that moment on, we had modern celebrities such as we had never seen before. Now, I then went to my publisher after that book was done to discuss whom I wanted to write about next, and I already had an idea in my mind, and she said, look, before you start writing about Wilson, she said, I know you don't really talk about this, but I know that on weekends and sometimes for weeks at a time, you seem to disappear, and I've heard that you have a friendship with Katherine Hepburn. Is that, is that true? Um, <laughs> And is she somebody you would ever write about? And I said, it is true, and it's funny you mention it, because it's something she mentioned to me uh, the day I met her in 1983. And I mean, literally, the, the first night we were having a drink, we were, we were speaking, um, she just turned to me and she said, you know, you should write about me. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, and I said, I, uh, yes, I, I should. She said, yes, because I'm fascinating. <laughs> <clears throat> um, <clears throat> um, well, well, I said, yeah, yes, you are. You are fascinating. Um, but, you know, at that point, I was writing my Goldwyn book. I said, I just you know, don't know. In any case, um, to shorthand that, and maybe someday I'll come back and talk to you about Katherine Hepburn. But uh, for 20 years, uh, we were friends. Uh, almost, well, sometimes we would spend uh, just a dinner together, sometimes we would spend two or three weeks together. In those periods, sometimes I lived in her house, actually, for a month or two at a time. I lived up on the fourth floor of her townhouse in, in Manhattan. Now, um, 
during the course of this period, after each meal, after each drink, after each conversation, she would always say the same thing. Go upstairs and write down everything I just said. <laughs> Why? Because I'm fascinating, you guys. Um, and she was, and I did keep notes, and indeed, for 20 years, I was basically writing down everything she said, which was the story of her life. And so there it was. Now, um, my publisher said, would you, you know, would you ever write a book? And I said, well, I will, but the one thing she always asked was that I not publish anything about her while she is alive. And the publisher said, that's fine. She said, you couldn't publish, but why don't you write the book? Catherine Hepburn is going to die someday. I said, I'm, I don't know about that. Um, you know, she's now 85, then she was 90, then she was 95. She wasn't going anywhere. But indeed, finally, sorry, finally at 96, she did die. Um, and I had a book all written, which was something she always wanted. Not only a book, but she said, publish this book as close to my death as possible. And indeed, because the book was all written and edited, two weeks after she died, my memoir of her, Kate Remembered, in which she basically narrated her entire life to me. It's almost like Scheherazade um, was published. And there it was. And now here I am back with my publishers. And now let's talk about Woodrow Wilson a little, because I said to my publisher, the book I really want to write that I want to spend the next decade on little did I know it would creep into 13 years, is the story of Woodrow Wilson. Wilson had been a boyhood hero of mine. I read a, a short biography of him when I was 15 years old, when I was attending Palisades High School, just down the road here. Um, I had, well, hey, we're among friends here. I think I was probably the only kid in Pally High if not in all of Brentwood, uh, who had Woodrow Wilson's poster on his wall. <laughs> uh, but I did. I did. I really adored this figure. And since I was 15 years old, uh, I have been reading of, from, by, and about Woodrow Wilson, such that I felt mature enough as a reader and able enough as a writer, having then written four books, to do what I thought was a book that Wilson himself deserved. Because, and here are two points, and if you leave today with nothing more than this about Woodrow Wilson, I hope you will take these two points with you forever. The first is, I believe Woodrow Wilson is the most influential figure of the 20th century, period. Not the most influential president, not the most influential American. I think he is the person who changed the 20th century more than any person who ever lived. Okay? That's item one. Item two, and this is something that I had a hunch about and became truer and truer during the 13 years that I was putting my biography together. And that is, I believe Woodrow Wilson had the most dramatic personal story of any person who has ever inhabited the White House. That is, I think this president, our 28th president, had the most interesting personal story. And this is something I wanted to tell. This is ultimately why I wrote my book. You know, biographers, it's, it's very rare. I, I was a fortunate one with my first book, Max Perkins, but it's very rare when a biographer has an idea for a book that is brand new, that nobody's ever written about. Nobody had ever done a book on Max Perkins, this incredible man who changed the course of American life. Nobody had ever written about it. But Woodrow Wilson, there had been hundreds, thousands of books about Woodrow Wilson. So what is it? What is that? What is that element of hubris within me or any biographer who thinks, who says, I have something new to say about this man? And what I felt I had new to say, well, well, they were basically those two points. A lot of people had touched on the influence, but nobody I felt in all the things I had read on Wilson I saw glimmers of this deeply romantic, intense, passionate, personal side. 
But I had never seen a book that captured that from the beginning of his life to the end. And that became the great challenge for me. And that is ultimately why I wanted to write this book <coughs> on Wilson. So let me give you um, a few bullet points. Um, those of you who are in the study group, I think these are really the tent poles of, of what you have been doing and are continuing to do for the next few weeks. But for those of you, well, just so you can keep up your end of the conversation. <laughs> I mean, that you're not just standing there. Uh, let me give you a few of the bullet points, a few, you know, basically a few branches on the tree. And then when we talk later up here in our small group, we'll hang some ornaments on those branches. But here are some things, again, I'd like you to walk home with in thinking about Wilson. The first is, <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson is the most religious president we have ever had, period. This is a man who is the son of a Presbyterian minister, the grandson of a Presbyterian minister. I went back nine, ten generations in his family trees. There were a dozen Presbyterian ministers there. Woodrow Wilson is a president who got on his knees to pray twice a day, every day of his life. He read the Bible every day of his life. He said grace before every meal. I know we have had a lot of religious presidents before. Usually they're very religious once every four years. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson was religious every moment of his life. Religion informed everything he thought, said, and did. And amazingly, he did it in a very modest way. It was in a way that wasn't offensive to other people. For someone, it, it was so deep within him, he really didn't wear it on his sleeve. It really came from his heart. This is going to become very important when he becomes president of the United States. <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson, point two, was the first southerner elected to the White House after the Civil War. This was an extremely important political event. So, Woodrow Wilson across three centuries, he is a 19th century figure. He was born in 1856 in Stanton, Virginia. Woodrow Wilson, you see, was born before the Civil War. Woodrow Wilson's father, a minister, moved to Georgia, to Augusta, to Columbia, South Carolina, moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, took the family, obviously, wherever he went. But here's Woodrow Wilson, known as Tommy Wilson as a little boy, who was raised in the South, not just mm, the fringe of the South, the deep South. He understood the South. His first memory was of the Civil War breaking out, hearing that there was going to be a great war once Lincoln got elected. He remembered Reconstruction extremely well. This was something he carried with him. He carried, well, he remembered the atrocities of the war, and he remembered the great adversities that accompanied Reconstruction. This, too, something he is going to carry with him for the rest of his life. Now, Woodrow Wilson, <clears throat> here's another thing for you. Woodrow Wilson is the most educated president we have ever had, period. That's it. Now, I hasten to add, I didn't say he was the most intellectual president. I mean, one has to consider Thomas Jefferson. Uh, one might even throw James Madison in there. One might even throw in Bill Clinton, for that matter. Yeah, a genuine intellectual, like his politics or not. Um, in fact, I have seen Bill Clinton, whoever, was it you? I've seen Bill Clinton give a one and a half hour lecture on Woodrow Wilson before 200 Woodrow Wilson scholars, which he gave without a note for an hour and a half. I mean, this man knows a lot, but I digress. <laughs> <coughs> Woodrow Wilson uh, went to Davidson College for a year in North Carolina, got sick, then started Princeton. It was then called the College of New Jersey, but then Princeton University. Um, he studied there. He became a very good student. Wilson, thinking he might want to go into politics, figured he needed a law degree, so he went to the University of Virginia, where he studied law. He tried practicing law in the South for a while, in Atlanta. He proved to be a total bust at that. <laughs> 
And so he decided, because he had fallen in love with a beautiful southern woman, that he wanted to get married, that he needed a career, and he decided the thing he loved most in the world was academia. Obviously, to go into academia, you needed an advanced degree, or so he thought. And so he went to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, which had really op just opened, really, this fabled PhD program. And Woodrow Wilson became one of the very first graduate students in this country in a brand new field called political science. And Woodrow Wilson become one of, became one of the great poli-sci students that this country has ever had. And indeed, what became his dissertation was his first book, which was about congressional government. We have had no president, with the possible exception, again, of Madison, who wrote the Constitution. Um, we've had no president who had a greater command of the Constitution. So there you have that, Woodrow Wilson, most educated. Now, Wilson uh, is teaching, teaching, teaching. He teaches uh, at, at a brand new all-female college in Pennsylvania called Bryn Mawr. He then moves on to Wesleyan in Connecticut, and then he got the call he hoped he might get if he was going to have a career in academia, and that was to teach at his alma mater of Princeton, where he went in 1890. So now here's Woodrow Wilson teaching, teaching, teaching. We've, um, all of us who have not, if you've been to college, if you've been to high school, if you've been to elementary school, we all had that one teacher. <laughs> you know, or even if you didn't have that teacher, you knew there was that one teacher on campus that just electrified the place. Everybody knew. That was Professor Woodrow Wilson at Princeton. Woodrow Wilson, would he take over a class that maybe had a dozen students in it? Within a year or two, there are 200 students because they wanted to hear the great man lecture, the great scholar on political science, on economics, on political philosophy, and he was the greatest orator on campus and then it was realized the greatest orator in the state of New Jersey, and now he's traveling around being asked to give lectures all the time, and people are starting to think this could be the greatest orator in the United States today. He was magnificent, simply magnificent. There is not a person who ever heard Woodrow Wilson and left some mention of it who didn't say this was the greatest speech giver I ever heard. And one of the secrets to his success, I think, and he did this when he was a candidate for office, and he did this as President of the United States, is this. Wilson never lowered the level of discourse. Now here he is, our only president with a PhD to this day. But Wilson talked to a bunch of farmers in the Midwest, a bunch of cotton pickers in the South, a bunch of industrialists in the North, the same way he would talk to people in his political science class. He didn't change the vocabulary. He didn't change the thought process. I have read, I was going to say hundreds, but I guess I've read thousands of Woodrow Wilson's speeches, all of which he wrote himself. He is the last president we have had who wrote every one of his speeches. And most of those speeches, in fact, he didn't write. Most of them he delivered off the cuff, and somebody would write them down just so we had a record of them. Going through thousands of these transcripts, I don't think I have found a single grammatical error, a single instance of one sentence that didn't follow the other, a paragraph that didn't logically lead into the next paragraph. He was just magnificent. Anyway, there he is. He has become such a great teacher. He has become so indispensable on the Princeton campus that in 1902, after he's been there for 12 years, this rather sleepy college, actually, which had really become a private reserve for not the rich in this country, but for the very rich, <laughs> for the sons of rich kids, of, of, of millionaires. And it was going nowhere. <clears throat> and at this moment in 1902, the, the uh, trustees of the college decided 
they needed a new president, and they unanimously settled on Woodrow Wilson. In 1902, he became president and was that for the next eight years. During that time, Woodrow Wilson changed not just education at Princeton. He changed education throughout this country and in many respects throughout the world. And if nothing else, this makes him one of the most influential people of the century, because we're now into the 20th century, okay? Now, if you went to a college or if you know someone who went to a college in which you majored in something, in which you took some elective courses that supported that major, in which you had distribution requirements. You had to study a science, or you had to study a, a social science if you were an arts major, whatever it was. If you had these various other requirements, you had to satisfy. If you had a class in which there were two lectures a week, and then a small class, a seminar, what Woodrow Wilson called a preceptorial, and throw in an honor code, too. If you had those elements, you studied under the Wilsonian method of college education. This was a model Professor President Wilson of Princeton put together. It was immediately adopted by the college, and to this day, practically every university in this country uses the Wilsonian method, without realizing it was Woodrow Wilson who invented this. Wilson now spends the next few years, having brought about these incredible educational, pedagogical changes. He is now concerned about social change on the Princeton campus. He really wants to turn this into an unsnobby place. And he's having a very difficult time doing that. And in fact, the trustees basically suggested, it might be time for you to move on. And indeed, there was a presidential vote coming up pretty soon. Now, <clears throat> he's losing battles with the trustees. At this very moment, a knock came on his door. And the knock came from the, well, gosh, how to set this up for you. But you have to accept this. It came from a man named Jim Smith. Jim Smith, he was better known as Sugar Jim Smith. Now, as I often tell audiences, I don't know many of you out here. I know most of you. I don't know what lines of work you're in, where you come from, but I will tell you this. Whatever your background or whatever your future, beware of men named Sugar Jim. <laughs> now, now, Sugar Jim, Sugar Jim was a political boss. He ran the Democratic Party in the state of New Jersey. Now, this is going to be hard for some of you to accept. New Jersey in 1910, <laughs> some people, I'm not saying this, but some people considered it the most corrupt state in the union. Imagine it if you can. If you can, take the leap. In any case, this state was so corrupt, largely because of Sugar Jim. And Ju Sugar Jim was so corrupt, he realized how corrupt he was such that he decided what we need to do to get elected is we need a front man. We need the squeaky cleanest guy in the state of New Jersey. Now, who is that? Oh, what about Professor Wilson at Princeton? He seems to know about government, but you know, he's a college professor. You know, how, how dangerous can he be? So let's go to him and say, Professor Wilson, um, we would like to run you for governor of New Jersey. And if you decide to run, we, I, Sugar Jim, uh, I can pretty much guarantee you're going to win the election. <laughs> and Professor Wilson said, after, you know, saying the conditions on the campus and what was about to happen to him, yes, I will run for governor. And he did. And he got elected in 1910. He got elected by a landslide. Sugar Jim did more than his work. But so did Woodrow Wilson, because Wilson proved to be, who knew? He proved to be an incredible campaigner. And again, a lot of it was <coughs> because New Jersey was a great agricultural state and an industrial state and an economic state, you know, a, a bedroom of New York City banks and all that. And here's Professor Wilson talking to everybody alike elevating everybody wherever he spoke. 
And got elected big, gets into office. The first thing he does as governor of New Jersey is kick out Sugar Jim. <laughs> Kicks out the political machine. I mean, literally, physically, they are not allowed in the state buildings. And now, everybody across the country is looking at New Jersey and saying, who is this man who just broke the most powerful political machine in the United States? This college professor did it overnight. And now, 1910, we're now into 1911, what do we have next year? A presidential election in 1912, and the Democratic Party is now saying this man is clearly presidential timber. Woodrow Wilson, in one of the most exciting primary seasons, uh, got nominated by the Democratic Party to run in the 1912 election, one of the great elections in this country. I mean, just to study the 1912 election, in which you have the Democratic nominee, Woodrow Wilson, running against an incumbent president, William Howard Taft, the Republican, running against a former president, Theodore Roosevelt, who is so disenchanted with what Taft has done with the Republican Party. He has bolted now, and Roosevelt has started his own progressive party, the Bull Moose Party. And just to add a little color to all this, Eugene Debs, the great socialist, is running. So we have a four-way race. It's fantastic. Wilson, in this great age of progressivism, proved to be the most progressive of them all, and the most articulate, and the most unlike any candidate the country had ever seen. And he won in 1912, well, with, with a, he, he only had a, um, a, didn't have a majority, he had like 42% when he won this election, but he had the greatest electoral college victory in the history of the country to that point. He won four-fifths of the states in the country. So it was quite amazing. And now Woodrow Wilson comes in and institutes, well, the greatest progressive agenda that any president had ever done. And now within a year, within two years, with, within before his first term was over, this was a man who totally restructured the economy of the United States. The first thing he does is gets rid of a rather archaic tariff system that really benefited the very rich, the very, very rich, the manufacturers, the owners, and the poor people were really paying for that. Wilson got rid of that. He introduced the modern income tax, a graduated income tax, which in essence redistributed the wealth. But again, this was a way Wilson believed it put every American on at least a more equal playing field. This is Woodrow Wilson, who's now introducing child labor laws, antitrust laws, 40-hour um, work week. It was Woodrow Wilson who put the first Jew on the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis. This was highly controversial when he did this. And it was, I mean, if some of you remember the Clarence Thomas hearings, that whole idea of, of hearings that got that nasty, that was nothing compared to the first public hearings on, a, on a, an appointee to the Supreme Court. And that was when Wilson appointed Brandeis. And they went after Brandeis for all sorts of things, but there was one unspoken thing, the great elephant in the room, that they didn't really talk about, but everybody knew. It's that this man was a Jew. And, and Brandeis squeaked by, and it became the first major shattering of a glass ceiling at the federal level in this country. So this is the sort of stuff Woodrow Wilson was doing. He was just on a roll doing all this stuff, largely because Wilson approached the White House. Again, don't forget, this is the greatest student of American politics, of the Constitution, of history. This is a man who wrote a dozen books. He wrote a five-volume history of the United States. He did a biography of George Washington. I mean, I mean, this man really knew this country. And now he's basically become the professor-in-chief 
not just for the country, but for the Congress. And here's why Wilson was so effective in large measure. Now, he was fortunate in that. He did have a Democratic Congress in the beginning. That helped a great deal. But Wilson really changed the way a president of the United States deals with Congress. Wilson had a notion. Now, get ready for this. This is so far out. You're going to hear it, and you're going to say, God, that's even far out for today. But Wilson believed that the executive branch of the government, the White House, the president, and the legislative branch, the Congress, you ready? That they should cooperate. <laughs> now, I mean this quite literally. He believed they should cooperate the government. They should do it together. And that is, it is indeed the task of the president to come up with a program and to present that program to the Congress, who has the power to pass the laws. And then it's up to the president again to kick that ball over the goalpost. So the way Wilson did this was he began to create a dialogue, you see, between the White House, he, Wilson, between him and the rest of the country, using the Congress as the medium. And so Wilson did something no president had done since John Adams in 1800. He went to the Congress. Whew. You know, every year now, we have a big thing of the State of the Union address. The president comes down, but yo, Mr. Speaker, da da da, the President of the United States, we all check, you know, and for a few hours, we're all one happy family. No president had ever done that. Woodrow Wilson did that. You know, before Wilson, the, the State of the Union address was written by somebody, and then it would be sent down to Congress, and a clerk would read it. And people would sleep or not even show up. Wilson wanted to have this dialogue started. Wilson came in with this very progressive agenda called the New Freedom. He had you know, these 15 things he wanted to do right away. He came in and he decided, I am going to call joint sessions of Congress. Now, if a president to this day calls a joint session of Congress more than once or twice, other than to give the State of the Union address, or other than to declare war, that's considered a lot. Woodrow Wilson convened joint sessions of Congress 20 five times. This is every few months. Every few months, and sometimes in the summer in Washington, before air conditioning, Woodrow Wilson would call the Congress. And he would go out there and say, I need a 40-hour work week, or I need a new tariff bill, or I need a new income tax. I need, and I left this out when he redesigned the American economy, something he called a Federal Reserve System. The federal banks, that reserve system, that bank system, was created by Woodrow Wilson. And he got this done in the first year that he's in office. This is the stuff he was doing, because he's having this conversation with the Congress. And they are working together. They are cooperating. He would have just kept on going just like a madman. He was doing so great, <clears throat> except something, well, two quite terrible things happened in 1914. The first is the world went to war. And what should have been a fairly innocuous assassination in Central Europe because of all sorts of nationalism, because of systems of alliances, secret treaties, suddenly the whole world was at war. The whole world except the United States, I should add. And off they went. So that's going on as the president is deciding what's the role the United States can play in this great conflagration. The second thing that happened, that very week that it all breaks out, his beloved wife dies. They've been in the White House a year. And this beautiful Southern woman who is talented, she could write, she, could, she read well, she was a beautiful painter, died. The president of the United States is bereft. Woodrow Wilson, I mean, they had exchanged thousands of love letters to each other, which, which I was able to read. I mean, they are, they are among the most passionate love letters ever written. 
And now this woman is gone. The President of the United States is contemplating quitting. He, he, he says to people, I can't, I can't go on. I can't serve the country. But what did pull him back was this great sense of Presbyterian duty. And he did keep us out of war for a couple of years. He, he urged strict neutrality in this country, 1914, 15, 16, got elected in 1916 on the slogan, he kept us out of war. By early 1917, the Germans are continuing to sink ships, including neutral ships. Hundreds, thousands of Americans are losing their lives, most famously on the Lusitania, which was exactly 100 years ago this spring, the sinking of the Lusitania. We're going to be hearing a lot about the Lusitania in the next few months, I think. In the next few years, we're going to be hearing a lot more about World War I. But here's Wilson keeping us out. But finally, he's re-inaugurated uh, in March, as used to be the case, of 1917. And by this time, uh, Wilson realizes not only are the Germans not backing down, they are stepping up. We learn about something called the Zimmerman Telegram, which was this secret communique between Germany and Mexico, urging them to come into the war. And gee, maybe we'll give you Texas and California back. Wouldn't you like that? Uh, so anyway, Wilson now goes to Congress yet again. He calls a joint session of Congress. But now Woodrow Wilson shows up on April 2nd 1917, if you remember no other date from this occasion today, take April 2nd, 1917 with you. Because on that date, I believe Woodrow Wilson delivered the most important foreign policy speech in the history of this country. Because in the middle of that speech is a single sentence, which I think is the most important single sentence in foreign policy in the last hundred years, or now 98 years, and Henry Kissinger agrees with me on this. <laughs> so you can take this to the bank. <laughs> and here it is, famously. You, you all studied it, but some of you might have forgotten it. The world must be made safe for democracy. It's that simple. Now, there's sometimes I'm not even sure what that means. There were a lot of people at the time who weren't sure what it meant. There are a lot of people who agree with it, a lot of people who don't agree with it. What, wherever you fall on this particular sentence, the world must be made safe for democracy, make no mistake about it. All foreign policy decisions since April 2nd, 1917 have been based on that Wilsonian principle that we, this mighty country, have a certain moral responsibility, uh, most religious president, have a certain moral responsibility to look out for all the other nations in the world. All these autocracies, the four great dynasties are collapsing in Europe, Central Europe, Asia. Uh, Asia. And here's Germany has been trampling over little countries like Belgium. Does the United States not have a moral obligation? to do something. Can we look the other way? Now, this argument has been used and abused for 100 years. But whether it's Mexico, or Haiti, or Vietnam, or what do we do about Syria, or Ukraine, whatever it is, it all goes back to Woodrow Wilson, not necessarily giving the answers today, but at least raising the questions or the big question, which nobody else had asked. Do we not have this moral obligation? Well, he was able to talk this country into going to war. Some people to this day think it is a great mistake. Some people think it is the greatest thing this country ever did. But in that moment, the United States began to emerge. And by the end of that war, we were the first modern superpower in the world. We had won the war. Wilson felt we had a moral obligation, now that we've won the war, to win the peace and to write the peace. And Wilson had several ideas of what that peace should be about. In fact, 
As some of you know, he had 14 of them. He called them 14 points. And the 14th point was really the most important. The others were, well, half of them were kind of ideas. Another half were very specific things about where boundaries should be drawn and all this. But the 14th point was quite simple, that there should be something called a League of Nations. It was a quixotic ideal. It was, um, it was almost out of King Arthur. It's that there should be a round table at which every country could come and sit. And before any country would go to war, they would sign on to the principles of the League and agree to discuss things at the table and work it out there. And if a country still wanted to go to war, you were not going to go to war with another country. You now have to take on everybody at the table. We call this collective security. Woodrow Wilson, moral, most religious president, go back to the beginning. That's where it all begins, with Wilson. Wilson was gone working on the peace in Paris for six months. Imagine this. If we have a president who takes a weekend off to play golf, that is a national problem. Woodrow Wilson was gone for six months came back to an extremely hostile Republican Congress who had agreed in his absence privately, no matter what he brings back, we're against it. Can you imagine this? <laughs> Have you ever heard of a Republican Congress saying, I don't care what the Democratic president wants, we're against it? That's what Woodrow Wilson faced <clears throat> when he came back. And indeed, he realized they weren't going to pass his, his treaty containing his beloved league. And so he decided, I will do what I do best. I will speak. And I will take my case. I'll do an end run. I'll go to the people. And he embarked on what I think is the most quixotic journey any president has ever engaged in. He traveled around the country in the summer of 1919 sometimes giving six speeches a day. His health was terrible, the summer was awful, and Wilson is out there selling his heart out, getting the country to endorse his League of Nations so that they will urge their Congress to vote for it, the Senate, who has the power to ratify treaties. And in the middle of this tour, the President of the United States collapsed. And they put Wilson back in the train. They sent him home to Washington in the dead of night. And they told nobody how sick he was. Three days later, Woodrow Wilson suffered a stroke. And now begins what I still consider the greatest conspiracy in American history. Because for the next year and a half, are you with me on this? A year and a half. Nobody in the country beyond the second Mrs. Wilson, he married a young widow from Washington, the second Mrs. Wilson, and a handful of doctors and one or two nurses and aides who were allowed into the presidential bedroom. Beyond that small group of people, nobody knew the President of the United States had suffered a stroke. This is quite and in fact, for all intents and purposes, and if you read the book, which I hope you do, you will see um, the evidence for an argument that I put out there, which is, I think it is safe to say that Edith Bowling Galt Wilson, you should remember her name, became the first female president of the United States. Because for a year and a half, she ran the executive branch of the United States government, period. Well, Wilson left the White House in 1921. He was the lamest duck who ever hobbled out of the White House. Quite literally, he had lost use of one side of his body, his left side. He could speak, he could think. He didn't get his League of Nations. Worse than that, he was replaced by Warren G. Harding, um, who began to undo everything Woodrow Wilson had done. Wilson became the only president to remain in Washington, D.C after the presidency. And if you ever go to Washington, and I hope you do, 
I hope you'll go visit his house, which is open, I think, 360 days a year. It's an amazing place. It's kept just the way it was when Woodrow Wilson left, uh, you know, lived there and ultimately died there. Died only three years later. And the amazing thing that happened, even though this man left the White House broken emotionally, physically, mentally, the Wilsonian reputation began to rise even while he was still alive, in large measure thanks to Warren Harding. Of course, I mean, let's face it, if you're going to be followed by somebody, be followed by somebody really corrupt, you know, because everyone began to feel nostalgia for the good days when Woodrow Wilson was here, when the government worked and everything was honest, and there it was. And you know, every Veterans Day, every November 11th, the celebration of the armistice, which had been signed in 1918, the 11th hour, the 11th day, the 11th month. First year, a few hundred people gathered outside Wilson's house on S Street. The next year, a few thousand people gathered. The next year, 20,000 people gathered outside this man's bedroom window, knowing they weren't going to get a glimpse of him, but maybe, who knows, he might wave from the window. And on a, the odd occasion, he would actually come down, and he could, and he did, speak to them. And Wilson, you see, became this great symbol of peace and freedom. And so, I will leave you with this thought, and then open things up to questions for a few minutes. But this is something Wilson said. And we didn't get into, believe me, there's a lot of negative stuff about Woodrow Wilson that I didn't get into, and perhaps we will in the questions. We didn't talk about race. We didn't talk about the alien and sedition laws that he introduced during World War I. Uh, there are some real dark sides to the Wilson administration. But this much keeps rising like cream. And it is this. Wilson said, we are not put into this world to sit still and know. We are put in it to act. Well, just by dint of the fact that every one of you is here today, you are acting in an educational way. But it behooves all of us, I think, to keep growing, to keep learning, to keep acting, to learn more about Woodrow Wilson, and then put the word out there about who he was. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I've, Thank I've you. left, I think, a few minutes for questions. Okay. Right? Right. Yes. Um, so fire away. And so uh, if you do have a question, please keep it to the point and uh, stand up. And keep it easy. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. When I was uh, at Princeton a few years before you, I came across the first of the 14 points Open Covenants openly arrived at, and I thought this was magnificent, but I now realize that was totally naive. Did he know how... I mean, did he have a different take on it, or was it totally naive? Why, do you want to tell us about the first point, which is open covenants open, openly arrived, arrived at? I can imagine the, the negotiations with Iran being openly arrived at. Well, I think Wilson, you know, this was the first point. You know, and what you have to remember is, when we finally got into the war, you know, we, we, we saw how intricate all these alliances were. By the time the war was over, Wilson began to learn about some alliances between countries that he didn't even know had existed. Some of these were truly secret alliances, secret agreements. Um, Britain and France, for example, had something called the Sykes-Picot Treaty. It really upsets me. I mean, here we've been you know, hearing about the Mideast, well, I was going to say for the last year, the last decade, the last century. But on the news every night, we hear about what's going on in Iraq or Iran or Syria or Jordan, you know, whatever. And we don't realize that there was a treaty, a secret treaty, you know, back during the war between Britain and France in which they basically carved up that whole part of the world themselves, for themselves and by themselves. And it was when we win this war, well, you'll get Jordan and we'll get Palestine and, you know, because they were basically splitting up the Ottoman Empire, which had, had fallen or was going to fall. So there it was. So this made Wilson 
crazy. Um, and it was especially crazy making when they were in Paris uh, making some real decisions, and it, especially with Italy, which had a really um, kind of dodgy role in, during the war. Now, anyway, to answer your question, I don't think Wilson was naive at all, and I think he had that in quotes. I mean, the Open Covenants definitely openly arrived at. It didn't mean every meeting to discuss every element had to be done in the public eye. He was the first to recognize you can't really do business. And in fact, most of the Paris talks were done just among the big four, um, alone in a room, maybe with their seconds and with translators. That was it, pretty much. So a lot of, a lot of the actual negotiating, the day-to-day -day stuff, um, has to be done in private, because there's, there's bargaining going on. But, what Wilson really meant, and what was the spirit of, of that first point, was that once something is decided, we put it out there for not just us to see, but for the world to see. So that's what he meant. Um, I, so I, I don't think he was naive, but I, I think he would have loved uh, your very close reading of that, um, and that you took him so literally. In an ideal world, he would have loved that, because he always talked about uh, the need for sunshine on everything to purify things and, and how um, that openness was most important. But he, but he knew the importance of, of, of actually settling things, dealing with things quietly and privately, and then making it all public. I, I have the mic. During uh, President Wilson's two terms, one of the, um, probably one of the most important political movements in the country was going on, women's suffrage maybe the most important since the 15th Amendment when the blacks, black males got, vote, got the vote. I'm with you. Leading to the 19th, was it the 19th Amendment that uh, <coughs> finally passed and gave, and gave them the vote? So my question would be, what was Wilson's participation, if any, in the women's movement and in support of the 19th Amendment? This is great. I'm so glad you brought this up. Because uh, this is one of the most controversial things about Wilson and his presidential administration. And if you ask most people who know something about Woodrow Wilson and your question, where, where was he on the suffragist movement, they would say that Wilson was the great villain. And we have seen pictures of, of the, um, the radical women in the movement, such as Alice Paul, um, chaining themselves to the White House fence, uh, big posters you know, across the White House lawn. You know, how can you be fighting in Germany when you, know, you have enslaved people, uh, women here in the United States? And indeed, Woodrow Wilson was not in favor of a constitutional amendment for women's votes until the war. Up until that point, two things. He was always in favor of women's suffrage. He had um, a wife and three daughters, and then a second wife. Um, they were all educated. Um, so he believed in that. But he believed it was a state's rights issue. Now, as we all know a century later, having been through states' rights issues in the 50s and 60s when it came to civil rights and the blacks, that's often code for I want things to stay the way they are. That wasn't really the case with Wilson who was actively out there campaigning for women's votes, but he did think it was state by state. Now, when we got into World War I, when we were actually in it in 1917, he had a complete overnight turnabout on that. Some of it, I mean, the Alice Pauls and the, and the, and the radical branch of the women's movement thought it was because of them I don't think it was. I, in fact, I think in some ways they slowed him down a bit. Uh, but he realized that, yes, we were fighting over there, and how is it that women don't have a vote? But more important, he saw the emergence of women during the war and a new role that women were playing, not just in the country, but in the world now. You know, women. You know, it takes a war to shake stuff up, and there are some benefits of wars. And in the case of World War I, you know, it's not just that 
that all the men were shipped, you know, we had two million men suddenly shipped overseas, so we now need women filling in, you know, so, in some cases, working on assembly lines, um, you know, which hadn't occurred before. So now women are outside the house, all that is going on. But beyond that, Wilson began to see and believe the importance of women just in day-to-day -day roles, just in home economy, and how that was really keeping the country going. And so he made it, and this was remarkable actually, he made it a war measure. So what did he do? He called a joint session of Congress, and he said, Congress, I need women to have the vote. No, we need it to win the war. It's that important. And it was still a very close vote, but it did squeak by. It was wildly controversial when he did it. And he lost a lot of his base support from the South. And the Southern Democrats had always been you know, his, his, his main platform there. But he did it. And even the Alice Pauls came around and not only thanked him, but basically said women would not. He, everyone always knew women were going to get the vote. But she was the first to say we would not have gotten the vote so quickly had it not been for Woodrow Wilson. So I would say he was slow in coming to it as a federal amendment. And once he did, he became its greatest advocate. And, and it happened almost overnight. Not only his turnabout, but women getting the vote. So I, I think that's where it goes. Uh, the book, Embers of War, begins with a man who we now know as Ho Chi Minh going to Paris specifically to see Woodrow Wilson because he was so impressed by reading about the 14 points and the right to self-determination, yet uh, Ho Chi Minh never got a chance to, to meet Wilson. Is there an explanation that you're aware yeah, of? Yeah, sure there is. There are a lot of explanations. First of all, it's not quite right that he went to Paris to meet Woodrow Wilson. That is to say, the man who became Ho Chi Minh, in fact, had been living in Paris for a couple of years during the war. And he was already there. He was a young man. Um, he washed dishes in restaurants. Um, he was sort of an art student. He would go to the library every day and read politics. He was reading Karl Marx. Um, so he, he was just kind of a young firebrand. He did send a note to Woodrow Wilson who then arrived in Paris. Now, you have to understand, the war ended. Woodrow Wilson, and I hope if you do nothing else, if you read my book, I hope you read about Woodrow Wilson's arrival in Paris, which is the greatest arrival of a single human being. It's a, it's a march of triumph, the likes of which Napoleon or Caesar never saw. Just the sheer magnitude of it. Everybody in the world who had any brief, any grievance, came to Paris. Not just heads of state, but anybody who had a cause. You know, the, the, there were pan-African conferences. There were women's conferences. Everybody went to Paris hoping to get an audience. Now, in comes a letter from a sometime um, dishwasher um, who does, actually his current job then was adding color to photographs, he would ha hand paint them, um, whose nobody's ever heard of from a country that nobody's ever heard of. It hasn't been recognized. I'm sure Woodrow Wilson never saw this letter. I'm sure the next person down never saw this letter. Uh, I mean, it was just a letter that, that came, you know? I mean, here Woodrow Wilson is dealing with uh, foreign ministers, uh, heads of state and, and all that. There's no way. Um, Ho Chi Minh was going to have an audience with Woodrow Wilson. Um, now, I'll tell you what I think related to this, though, might have had a more profound effect. And that is, and, and, and that was something that was, you know, and I was just going to say, you know, decades later, you know, Ho Chi Minh would say, there I was in Paris, I wanted to talk to the president, you know, and to tell him about my country. Well, yeah, sure, right. But I'll tell you what did happen. At the last minute while they are doing this treaty, there was a very sticky point between Japan and China. And in a couple of ways, Woodrow Wilson sold out the Chinese. And the next day, there were massive student protests across China. And one of the student protesters who, has just, who had just gone into the newspaper business, 
was Mao Zedong. And he very specifically refers to that incident. I mean, it's one of the great incidents in Chinese history on May 4th. Um, that really turned him into a revolutionary that very day. So I think there's definitely a direct line between Woodrow Wilson and the man who became Mao Zedong. But the Ho Chi Minh case is a little sketchier than that, a lot sketchier than that. If Wilson was such a consummate politician, why didn't he take any Republicans with him to the conference in Paris? Fair question. He, he took a Republican. Um, a rather harmless Republican, um, but he did. I mean, he took, he took, he took a very respected um, Republican who had been in the ambassadorial corps for 40 years, a white-haired gentleman, you know, who knew everybody and this and that. And so there he was, and that was kind of that. You know, I think Wilson believed this. This conference, it's a fascinating thing. You know, there, were, there were two dozen countries in Paris settling the world, dividing up the world, figuring it all out. The United States was the only one that went over to Paris that had, well, it had an agenda, but it did not include territory or treasure. Wilson did not want money from the losers. He wanted no spoils, he wanted no land, all the other countries, yeah, we want this, we want this, we want this, this seaport, this Poland, we want to make the, the border here. Wilson wanted none, none of that. So now Wilson is going to Paris. He realizes he is going to be up against 24 different countries. And I think he thought, if I also have to bring people with whom I'm fighting, just internecine warfare here, we are going to get nothing done, most of all, and ultimately, and I've, you know, I've sort of made this point, but let me underscore it. Wilson, I think, brought us into that war so he could get a League of Nations. He really did believe this could be the war to end all wars. And if only we have a League of Nations in place. And indeed, you know, I mean, there's a very good argument to be made, as Wilson himself said. Had there been a League of Nations in 1910, 1912, 1914, when that assassination happened in Sarajevo, the world wouldn't have gone to war. Everybody would have sat down at the table, they would have talked it out, worked it out, dealt with the countries as they needed to be dealt, but you know, they would have realized you're taking on everybody at the table. So I think Wilson felt it was just the easiest thing to do. Wilson had a very clear vision of what he wanted out of this conference. And, you know, he brought a few people. He, he really didn't pay attention to them. I mean, he brought his Secretary of State, who was somebody he barely spoke to. I mean, it was a man named Robert Lansing, uh, whom he used as a messenger boy, really. Wilson, Wilson, also, Wilson was the only chief of state who went over there. You know, the others, um, you, know, you know, the Prime Minister of England was not the chief of, of or was not the head of the country, sorry, he was chief of state, but, um, <clears throat> no, oh, head of the government, not the chief of state. So there's Wilson, um, and I think he figured, I just want, I need to do this alone. Uh, and this is in some ways related to the open covenants openly arrived at. He needed to sit down with you know, with Clemenceau of France and Lloyd George of England and even Orlando who would, you know, sort of flop back and forth. Uh, and just the four of them had to sit it out and talk it through. And, and each day the others would undo everything they had done and Wilson would just say, no, we've got to do this and this and this. And finally it was just, you know, when was everybody just going to surrender? And they finally did. So I think that's why. I think he just didn't want to be disturbed by the American politics while he's now trying to deal with global politics. And in some ways, was it a mistake? You know, if he had brought Henry Cabot Lodge, who was the head of the Republican Party, the Foreign Relations Committee, um, and his leading adversary when he was trying to get his league passed, I, I, you know, well, I don't do speculative history, so it's hard for me to say. But I, I don't know if, if um, Wilson would have been as successful in getting the treaty um, I think it would have been a much watered down treaty um, and everybody would have thrown their hands up 
Because, you know, countries were threatening to leave at all times. You know, Wilson, part of his job was just keeping everybody in the room. And so I think if they saw him fighting with Lodge, um, I just don't think it would have worked. And I think Wilson kind of guessed that, sensed that, intuited that. This is, uh, you almost answered the question, Mike. Uh, uh, if Wilson had been uh, less uh, ambitious, uh, had, sought, had tried to do less, in your opinion, speculative, <coughs> speculative history perhaps. But, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if he had done, done less what? If he had attempted less, uh, and uh, do you think we could have avoided World War II? And I might ask another uh, follow-up on that one. Uh, uh, you, meant, you used the expression uh, professor in chief, I think, with reason, and uh, referred to the present president, I believe. And what do you think of that role? Wait, wait now, what do, I, do you, the, the role of uh, the president as professor? As professor in chief? chief? Well, okay. Um, well, I mean, you ask a big question. This is the first one, and this is something everybody argues about. Um, you know, since then, you know, since World War II, could well, did Wilson, in essence, start World War II? Did that treaty start World War II? Um, Wilson felt he had made the best possible treaty he could. He argued almost every day with Clemenceau and Lloyd George and said the following. If you punish Germany, if you are too harsh, we are going to fight this same war again in 25 years. If you pull out your calendar, you'll see he got it almost to the week. He knew that. So the reparations and the territorial um, demands and all that that were met or not met were really kept to a minimum by Wilson, I think. The treaty, as even Wilson would have told you, was not a perfect treaty by any means. But he felt the imperfections were small enough that if we have a League of Nations the next two or three years, we can iron those out. Now, would Adolf Hitler have risen with or without Woodrow Wilson? I can't answer that question. I'm inclined to tell you he would have. I'm inclined to tell you that, that there were factions in Germany that were so disgusted with themselves and their leadership as to how that war went that they were going to rise again and that they wanted world domination because, you know, you know, of all the great capitals in the history of the world, we had the glory that was Athens and the glory that was Rome, we even had Paris and London. There was never the glory that was Berlin. They were never the center of the world. And I think there were some people who felt this was Berlin's time. It's now time for Germany to rise. So I always find it simplistic and really unfair to blame World War II on Woodrow Wilson or even on that treaty. And you know, even the reparations that remained there, and again, they were a fraction of what they would have been had Wilson not been there. Those, that reparations bill that was handed to Germany, it wasn't that harsh. They could have paid it. They had it. They had the money, and in fact, they never paid it. They paid 20 cents on the dollar. Now, John Maynard Keynes, great economist of the 20th century, he was part of the British group, and he was over there. And he said, and I, in retrospect, and I, this is, I think was right, it wasn't the reparations bill that was so harsh. The problem was nobody paid any attention to the rehabilitation of Central Europe. So there was this vacuum there, just this huge vacuum. Well, that's going to affect not just Germany and the countries around it, that's going to affect Britain and France, and thank you very much, that's going to affect the United States. And hence, the world sinks into this depression in the 1930s. In that regard, I think what they did in Paris really missed the boat. I mean, that was the one thing they didn't pay enough attention to, was the rehab. It was mostly about reparation, not rehabilitation. And that, I think, is a serious mistake. Professor-in-chief, <clears throat> I think, I will tell you one instance, and I think, this is, I think this is the worst moment in Woodrow Wilson's presidency, and the worst thing about him, and it's when he could have stepped up as professor-in-chief. And it has to do with race. And it's very complicated. Um, and in the book, 
um, our study group has seen, or will see, <clears throat> that I, I believe Woodrow Wilson was a centrist when it came to race, even though he introduced Jim Crow into the federal government. It was basically there, but he made it institutional because he felt the country was not ready to change. He simply felt in 1913, you cannot sit a black worker next to a white worker at lunch uh, or in the same bathrooms. That's simply, or one day, you simply cannot have a white woman reporting to a black man. I mean, you know, don't forget Washington was a small southern town in 1913. So he Wilson really tried to have a happy medium. Now, all that said, put that aside, I don't think that's the worst thing Wilson did. And that's, many consider that plenty bad. What I think is the worst thing he did is tens of thousands of black soldiers fought in World War I. And they thought this would be their moment to prove that they were 100% Americans. Black mothers lost their sons just the way white mothers did. And hundred, no, well, tens of thousands of black, no, into the hundreds of thousands of black soldiers came back from the war. And I think they felt this was the moment we can kind of change the game here. This is the moment we'll be embraced. And I think this would have been an easy opportunity for the professor in chief, Woodrow Wilson, a southerner who really did want to help the African Americans in this country, to step up and say, you know what? We've all fought this war together. We must now embrace all our soldiers who put their lives on the line. And Wilson said nothing. Now, not many people were saying anything in his defense, but he said nothing, and I don't think it is a coincidence that the summer of 1919 had the worst race riots in the history of this country, not just here or there, but in two dozen cities, from Buffalo to Arizona, I mean all over the place, and I mean big, bloody, bloody riots that would go on sometimes for weeks, sometimes in one or two occasions for months. And I think Wilson's omission here was worse than anything he committed, and I think it would have been an opportunity as professor in chief um, to do something that really could have been a game changer. And then of course, the moment was gone, and then we had you know, another 50 years, of, or another yeah, 40 or 50 years of basically separate but equal, and it wasn't until Brown versus Board of Ed. And when it comes to race, I hasten to add this, and I'm not his defender, but I want to be his explainer, which is even when Brown versus Board of Ed happens in the mid-50s and we have race rights into the 60s, this country still wasn't ready. You know, and all you have to do is open up the newspaper today. We're still not ready. I mean, Ferguson, Missouri, I don't know, it's 100 years later. So we still have a lot of educating to do, but I think that could have been a major milestone from a professor in chief. Okay, I think on that note, we're gonna to have to wrap it up. We thank, thank you, you for a wonderful presentation.